This was worship. This is, these are sounds of heaven that we're getting a preview about. Wonder what the music is going to be like in heaven. It's going to be like that and beyond. So, where eye has not seen and ear has not heard, what the Lord has prepared for His people. Amen? Amen. It's going to be a glorious time, folks. Just count the minutes, count the seconds. We are on our way to heaven. Amen? Amen. Let's give God a round of applause. Amen. Amen. I'd like to take you to a verse of scripture tonight in John chapter 5, verse 5. I'd like to help me read it. Would you please? Let's read it all together. And a certain man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. I'd like you to bow your head with me right now before the Lord. And let's ask him very simply and very gently and very humbly, Lord, speak to my heart tonight. Tell him, Lord, speak to my heart tonight. Please speak to me tonight. I want to hear your voice. To me, personally, I need it. Address me. I'm open. I'm listening. Amen. And a certain man was there. There where? Where is that place? Some of you know probably John chapter 5 where it was. If we go three verses before that in John chapter 5 verse 2 it says, Now there is in Jerusalem, but specifically by the sheep gate a pool which is called Bethesda. Right there, by that great pool of Bethesda, having five porticos, five porticos that lead to that pool there was something going on there and that's where this man was and he was not alone it says that in these those five porticos by the pool of Bethesda by the sheep gate in Jerusalem there there was also a multitude so many others of those who were like this man invalid sick blind lame, withered, and I underline that word, what they were doing. Guess what they were doing? Waiting. Would you say that word with me again? Waiting. Waiting. Now that man, he's been waiting for close to how many years? 38, 38 years. And I want to tell you that in Bethesda, people majored on one thing, on waiting. They were waiting. And nothing was happening. And they were waiting that somehow the waters will be moved. That there is an, a certain kind of teaching that an angel will descend from heaven, move the water, and whoever jumps first will get healed. But that man was there for 38 long years. And they were waiting. And that man was there. Right there. And nothing was happening to him for 38 years and I want to tell you tonight that there are scores of people who are in the business of waiting for something to happen in their lives and they've been waiting and more waiting and time passes by and nothing happens and I want to tell you tonight enough waiting because Jesus is in this place there is no need to pay to wait anymore when Jesus is in a place there's no need to wait. You don't need to go to Bethesda. You know what Bethesda is? This is a transliteration, Bethesda. In Arabic, Beth means house, house of mercy. But I want to tell you, we should have probably called it more than house of mercy as the house of misery. This is the house of where you go there and you wait. And I tell you, you know, one day something might happen, a miracle might take place, just go ahead and wait. Doesn't that remind you of religion? Religion all over the world makes people wait. I mean, there are people waiting. There are people waiting in religion. They're waiting for an event. Such religion is waiting for an event. Such religion is waiting for another event. 
and they keep waiting and they are just counting the years and they say perhaps it will happen in my lifetime perhaps it won't perhaps it will happen in the lifetime of my children my grandchildren people are in the business of waiting and I tell you today wait no more because in our midst he said where two or three are gathered in our midst in my name I shall be in their midst Jesus is here Jesus in this place we shall we we, we praise him we spoke about him we have offered him our hymns and our prayers and he has given us his assurance that where two or three are gathered in my name there I shall be in their midst there is no need for wait anymore folks where Christ is there is no need to wait the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 2 behold now is the accepted time behold now is the day of salvation folks people are waiting in America they're waiting they're hoping that the next election will bring the relief for America in Mecca they're waiting they're going to the Hajj this week by the millions in Mecca they're waiting for something to happen in the Middle East all over the Middle East I want to tell you what is this Arab Spring is all about it's about waiting for a change. People are expecting that if there is a new government, things will go and happen better. Guess what? They are disappointed as soon as the new government comes in. They start asking for another new government. And then as we will get another president, if we get another president, or even we get the same president, guess what will happen? Shortly after the election, guess what happened? People will start complaining, saying, boy, we need another president because people are waiting for relief and relief does not come folks the relief is right here in our midst and his name is jesus christ the one who will solve the issue, the one who will declare himself as the healer and the one who will change things once for all believe on the lord jesus christ the jailer in philippi asked Silas and Paul, what must I do to be saved like you guys? I'm here you were in the prisons and here you were singing praises to the Lord. What is your secret? I need to know. And soon when he saw that even when the doors were open and these people didn't leave the, the jail, he said, I need to become like you. Like what we heard earlier. I need to become like you. What must it take for me to become saved? And they said, believe right now in this moment and you will be saved. People are waiting. I don't want to tell you what long waiting does. It's depressing folks. Imagine there are religions who will want you to wait, not only to wait with doing nothing, but they put a list of things for you to do. What you should eat, what you should not eat, how you should dress, how you should not dress, etc. And they go through those rituals and they're waiting. And there are people who continue to wait. And there are people who are wavering. There are people who begun a work with the Lord Jesus Christ and said, I have become a Christian. But they keep wavering. They're still in the same spot. How long have you been a Christian? 20 years. What have you done in the last 20 years? How much of the Bible do you know? Well, I read it occasionally. How often are you committed to attend a meeting? Well, I go when I can. How are you advancing in your faith? And they have no idea because they're wavering. They're depressed. They're disappointed. They've had some plans of their own that didn't happen. I don't want to tell you that. It is to them that I preach this sermon tonight. The sermon of the man in Bethesda who waited 38 years but who was healed in an instant by the Lord Jesus Christ. It is to you that I address this sermon tonight. Wait no more. Stop waiting. I'll give you that sermon in four points. Four quick points. The first point is we notice from this man who was waiting at the pool in Bethesda that the Savior knew exactly this man's condition. Look what it says in the verse right after, in verse John chapter 5, verse 6. When Jesus, look at this word on the line, saw him. Now, remember, in Bethesda there were multitudes, right? But Jesus' eyes were, were on one man. And I always wonder, why did the Lord pick me up? Because I get saved at this age exactly. Why did the Lord pick up the man who's been waiting 38 years? I tell you and I guarantee you because he was probably the worst of all the invalids in Bethesda. And tonight if you feel like you are one of the worst, that's exactly who the Lord is addressing tonight. There's somebody here in this place who feels that my sins are so bad 
that I'm probably the worst. My faith is so poor that I'm probably the last one to ever be saved. I am so far, so distant, so hopeless, so disappointed, and so disappointed. It is to you. It is on you that the eyes of the Lord are fixed today. The Lord Jesus saw him. He pointed at him. The Lord Jesus sees you tonight. He sees you in your conditions. He sees you in your depression. He sees you in your disappointments. He knows exactly what you're going through. Not only this, it says that Jesus knew. You see, not only does he see, but he knows, folks. He knows exactly what you're going through. He knows exactly the conditions that are eating you up inside. He knows those secrets that you're holding on from everybody else. He knows what is tormenting you. He knows what's torturing you tonight. And it says here, it says that he had already been a long time in that condition. Jesus sees you. Jesus knows you. And I can guarantee you that the Lord Jesus wants and he will bless someone here tonight. He's going to bless someone here tonight. Why wouldn't it be you? He wants, he's looking, he's in our midst, and he wants to bless someone right here tonight. And I want to take the second point that we notice from this man's condition is that the same, not only he knew exactly his condition, but the Lord Jesus awakened this man's heart petition. Now this man is sitting idle, and I can guarantee you when the Lord Jesus walked in near that pool of Bethesda, people's eyes were not on Jesus Christ. They were on the pool. They were waiting for that water to be stirred up. Would the water be stirred up? Would the water not be stirred up? 30 years, eight years later, nothing is happening. But then the Lord Jesus walks and nobody pays attention to him. But he goes to this man and he points to him and he looks at him and he knows him and he says to him, wake up do you want to be made whole are you wanting to be changed do you want to be changed this man said of course i mean you know that's inside of me all these 38 years and the lord jesus wants to wake you up tonight he said do you want to be changed enough waiting do you want to be made whole tonight do you want to be re-energized revitalized given a new power and a new condition of life tonight or do you want to continue the way you are lord jesus is asking this question tonight he asked this man the same question wake up people sometimes forget what life is all about they think that life is about eating drinking having family going to work etc and then you die they think that life is about maybe perhaps raising your hand at a meeting and becoming a christian and then you know you go occasionally to church etc and then and then you have family and you tell them about Jesus whether you accept it or not and then you die. They think that this is all what's about life. They don't realize that God has destined us for a glorious living. To represent Him. To carry the greatest message ever known to mankind's problems. The solution of mankind's problem is going to be carried by sinners who get saved like you and me. God wants to send missionaries all over the world. And He wants to accomplish a purpose beyond anybody's imagination. And He has destined us for glory after glory. Do you want to be made whole? Or do you want to remain paralyzed for another 38 years? And I wish you say yes tonight to this. I wish somebody would look and say, you know, I wish it will happen to me. I hope someone here is saying, you know, I feel like this man. I mean, I may be a Christian by name, but really, I'm paralyzed. I haven't done anything worthy to the Lord. Tonight is your night. Or maybe you can say, I'm not sure if I'm saved. Tonight is your night to be changed. And the Lord is asking that question. Does anybody here want to be changed? Hope you say yes. Because this man indeed did say yes. And I want to tell you, you can continue waiting for another 10 years. I met uh, this young man who once, uh, I was telling about the Lord Jesus, about the judgment to come, soon to come. He looked at me and said, I'm very young still. I said, what does that mean? He said, I still have a few more years to go. I'll think about it. And I want to tell you something. When this guy said this and he looked at me, he said, would you pray for me? I said, no, I'm not going to pray for you. I offered you the message of salvation and you flat out refused it. You deserve to be lost. I will not pray for you. He said, you're not going to pray for me? I mean, you're going to let me go to hell? I said, you're letting yourself go to hell. 
<laughs> if you really take this message seriously, you will look at it right now and make a decision right now. He said, you know, I think I better take it seriously. I said, now I'm free. <laughs> now I'm free. Let's bow down and pray to the Lord. And this man accepted the Lord. Just pray for me that it changed my mind. I say, your mind is in your hand. I cannot change your mind. You have to make your mind. You have to make up your mind. You can continue waiting. And you know, there are prisoners who are in jail for long term on death row. And they're waiting. And they say toward the last week when they announce to them the day of execution, they stop waiting being bored. When they realize that there's a day coming when judgment is going to happen and execution will take place, these people panic suddenly. They wake up and they begin asking for psychiatrists and doctors and people saying, please come and help me because I'm going to die in a few days. And I want to tell you, there's a day coming where every one of us is going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ as believers or before that great white throne as unbelievers for it's been appointed unto men to die once and after this judgment you can wait but you cannot afford to continue waiting you can wait in your service but you cannot afford to continue serving not serving because the day of renting accounts is coming whether you like it or not we need to wake up we do not say to be saved if you're saved just by name to get really with it and begin serving the Lord Jesus. You cannot afford to wait. And I want to tell you something, you cannot change yourself. So I want to make you relax because some people say, how can I do it? You cannot even change yourself. You see, change is not from you. This man did not, who's an infant of 38 years, he didn't heal himself. He was healed by Christ. The power is in Christ, is not in you. What's going to change is not you. It is Christ. What you want to do is just want it, will it, wish it, desire it, say yes to it. When the offer comes, do you want to be changed? All you have to say is yes. And desire to be changed, the power is not from you. The change is not from you. It comes unto you, from outside of you, and it lands in you, and it will change you. The Bible says in Romans chapter 7, verse 18, after he says, there's nothing good in me, the Apostle Paul, he adds after that, he says, for to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. I cannot do it, but I can only wish it. I can only desire it and God is not asking you to do it. He's not asking you to change. You cannot change yourself. But you can only desire to be changed. And the Lord Jesus is, this evening is asking, don't change yourself. You can't. But would you like me to change you? Do you want to be changed by me? Do you want me to do the change? Do you want to be made whole? People for years have tried to figure out what happens to people when they get saved. Or when they get dedicated to the Lord Jesus. How did this happen? What did he do? What is his secret? What's your secret? There is no secret, folks. Folks, there is no secret in this. The only secret is that these people heard the word, heard the call of the Lord, and they said yes to it. When the Lord comes knocking on the door of your heart, would you like to be changed? Your answer should be, please change me. Yes. The change is not from you. It is from Him. God never drags people against their will to heaven or to serve Him. It is up to you whether you want it or not, but the doing is from God, not from you. And the third point is, not only the Lord Jesus knew this man's condition, not only that He awakened his heart petition, but also this, the Savior heard this man's position. You see, when the Lord comes to us with this request, would you like to be changed? We start arguing with him. And this man did. You know, it's amazing. Would you like to be changed? Uh, Lord, what are you talking about? I mean, I've been like this for so many years. I don't think I can be changed. Would you like to become my servant? Uh, Lord, I don't think, I think you got the wrong person. Because you see, in my condition, you know, I'm not like the guy next door whose father is a, a pastor or mother is a worker at the church. No, no, no. I'm from an average family. God is not looking for fancy people, folks. He's looking for the average person. And he is willing to argue and reason with you about your condition. This man said, the sick man answered him and said, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. I have no humans to help me. And I want to tell you, scores of people blame others for the fact that they're not saved. Or they're not serving God well. Some people blame it on their wives. 
Some wives blame it on their husbands. Some people blame it on their children. Some people, I heard somebody said, it's the fact that my father and mother are so committed to the church, it turned me off. And then the reverse. It's because my parents are committed to the church, that's why I'm not following the Lord. There's always a reason. We blame it on other people. If I had such and such, then I will follow the Lord. If my parents were walking, if my parents were not walking, if my surrounding, if I had the right friends, if I was born in the right country. And boy, does the Lord listen to all these arguments. And He says, okay, I've listened to your argument now. I repeat the question, would you like to be changed? Would you like me to change you? Forget people. And I want to tell you, there's nothing worse in anyone's life except putting your eyes on people, on humans. Folks, enough putting eyes on humans. This is about the Lord Jesus doing the work, not humans. If you want to be a Christian, it's not people who are going to make you a Christian. If you want to serve the Lord, it's not people who are going to make you serve the Lord. It is Christ and Christ alone. And He's in this place and He's asking the same question. Do you want to be changed? You? Do you want to be changed? Not by people. Forget people. In the words of Job, Job had four people come to visit him to comfort him. You know what he said? He told them at the end. He said, Miserable comforters are all you all. They came to comfort him. They made him more miserable. If your eyes are on people, if your eyes are on religion, if your eyes are on sacraments, on formalities, on tradition, you will be discomforted and made worse than what you are. Enough. Enough. Turn your eyes off people and look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Put your eyes on the one who can change you and change you instantly and change you even tonight. And the fourth point that leads me to the last point. Not only the Lord knew this man's condition, not only did he awaken his heart's petition, not only did he listen to his position, but the Lord also healed this man entirely and far above his expectation. This man was invalid. He had not moved for 38 years. So what the best he could hope for that he can move? that he can get, get up and walk on his feet. Oh no, he got a lot more than that, folks. Listen to this. Jesus said to him, get up. That would have been enough. Thank you. But he said, no, I want you to take your bed and walk. The guy said, are you kidding? I mean, you know, getting up is more than enough. You want me to carry a bed? Do you realize that I haven't moved for 38 years? Some of you are physicians here. Some of you know about this. Have you ever seen a guy in a cast for even a month? You know what happened to those muscles? They melt. They, they atrophy. They vanish. Imagine a fellow for how many years? That's close to 40 years, folks. He hasn't moved. And the question is, I'd like you to get up and I want you to carry your bed. Not only do I want you to walk, I want you to walk like an athlete from here on, says the Lord Jesus. <laughs> Boy, sometimes we ask the Lord for a small thing and we get a huge thing. Sometimes we say, Lord, I'm, I suffice me the things that I'm going to ask the Lord. Say, oh no, I don't work like this. I give according to my riches in Christ Jesus. I give far above your expectation. And immediately it says, because this man listened by faith. He said, you know, I've never done it for 30 years, but there is this one man who seems to have authority, who's commanding me, and I'm going to just obey. And suddenly he sees that his feet are jumping, and he sees that he's able, he has muscles, not only in his feet, but his arms, and he carries the bed, and he is walking, and he begins to walking, and the power realizing this not from him. It couldn't have been from him. This is a new power. Something new has happened to this man. And this man became the man of Bethesda who suddenly was healed above everybody's expectations. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, Now unto him that is able to do, what? Exceeding abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Christ works when you listen to his command. Christ works when you desire what He wants to do in you. Christ works when you receive it by faith and not by sight. Amen. People say, what do you mean? I mean, doesn't that take about 10 years of physical therapy? No, folks. 
This is not about physical therapy. This is not, they're going to take my sins are so bad, I'm not going to have to go to a 10 or 12 or 15 steps program. Or, no, folks. God doesn't work like this. I don't care what your sin is. I don't know what's dragging you. I don't know what's paralyzing you tonight. I don't know what's keeping you from becoming the person that Christ wants you to be. I don't know what is not giving you a purpose in life. I don't know what's holding you. I don't know what has kept you up to now. But Christ is in our midst. And He says, do you want me to change you tonight? And all you have to do is just believe it. Take your bed and begin listening to that command. Christ always works by command. If you look throughout the Bible, it is command. God doesn't save people by saying, if you like, make your point, choose, and think about it, and study it, and then decide. No. Christ gives a command. He says, I command you. I command you to repent. I command you to live. I command you to receive my change. In Ezekiel chapter 37, the, the the chapter about the dead bones the Lord says to Ezekiel would these dry bones live and he says to him Ezekiel said I don't know you know you know Lord he said prophesy to those bones dead bones I command you I will send a breath of life into you know and you will live and I will cover you with chair and skin and whatever it is and the dead bones did live and the Bible says in Acts chapter 17 Paul in Aeropagos in his sermon he says God discards those moments of not knowing, but now He commands all people to repent because He has appointed the day where He's going to judge the world by one man that He raised from the dead, giving proof that He is the man that they should believe in, Jesus Christ. The Bible says, I command you. And Christ here in this place says, Ray, tell them that Christ commands you. So I'm just a messenger, folks. He's not giving you options. You either listen to the command or you can disobey the command. But you can only blame yourself if you disobey the command. But Christ is commanding. And Jesus said to him, get up, take your bed and walk. And immediately this man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. This man wanted to get up. This man wanted to obey. This man desired. This man listened. This man took his first step by faith. And I want to tell you, I want you to tonight, if you have not taken that step of faith, or that step of consecration, or that step of commitment, tonight is your night. I don't know what's holding you, but you and God know what's holding you. And Christ says, I don't care how big it is, how long you've been like this, no matter how many years you've been like this, Tonight is a night of change if you believe the Lord Jesus in our midst. And he asked the questions, do you want to be made whole? And if you say yes, and I hope you do, he tells you get up. Get up. Arise. No longer I want you to be the same. From this night on, let this be a new fresh night for you with your relationship with the Lord Jesus. Unsaved, come and get saved tonight. You're not sure of your salvation like we heard about those points of those who are saved. Tonight is the night to have a new nature in you. The one who paid for your sins on Calvary is right here to give you complete forgiveness. Past, present, and future. It's not religion that's going to save you. It's not the saints that's going to save you. It's not your works that's going to save you. It is Christ and Christ alone. He's in our midst and He says, do you want me to change you? And if you are being a Christian, but somehow a dull Christian, a paralyzed Christian, a Christian that is wavering, one day with the Lord, one day without the Lord. One day you want to go to church, one day you don't want to go to church. If you are that kind of Christian, tonight is a night of change. And Christ says the same words, do you want to be made whole? And if you say yes, He wants you to get up and begin a new existence, a new fresh light. I'd like to give a chance while we're listening to this song by my friend CJ, I'd like to give a chance, whoever says, I wanna be changed, while we're singing, just stand up in your place, and then we pray at the end. Go ahead, brother CJ. That's CJ and Destiny. You 
to the fall Now I give it all to you Give it all to you My past can't find the present No more will I believe the lies that hold me down I'm running after a